Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thanks to Sages and the moderators for inviting me to uh, speak today. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures, none of which are uh, relevant to this talk. So I, I thought for this talk I sort of had a, a broad mandate to talk about the outcomes of dilation. So I, I, the way I framed it for myself was just to try to give a um, algorithm for how you can think about uh, approaching uh, dilation uh, and what factors you need to think about and consider when coming up with a plan for uh, pre-dilation uh, preparation, intra-dilation, uh, uh, the procedure itself, and post-dilation. And it really boils down to three factors. So the first is the lesion. Uh, what are you dilating? Uh, and to, you know, obviously these are shades of gray, but uh, simply in your mind classify this as a simple uh, lesion or a complex lesion. Uh, the next is the patient. Um, is this patient a low-risk patient or a high-risk patient? And then uh, the third thing is, is what, are the, what is the goal of dilation? That, that might seem simple, but uh, really thinking about that in a systematic way, uh, what you're trying to achieve with the dilation will help guide uh, uh, what you do with the procedure and, and afterwards. And then uh, based on those, uh, you can really come up with a plan for before, during, and after the dilation. So the first is the, uh, the lesion. And uh, broadly, you can classify these into simple and complex. Uh, so simple lesions are benign. Um, uh, any malignancy makes it uh, immediately a, a very complicated situation. Simple lesions are wide and short. Uh, so that they, they have a diameter of 12 millimeters or more, and you could say, well, how do I know that? Well, the, most endoscopes are about nine millimeters in diameter, so if you can easily pass the endoscope through the lesion, uh, that means it's a simple lesion. And the length uh, is two centimeters or less. And they have straightforward anatomy, and I'll, I'll describe what might make that complex. So here are some simple lesions. A Schatzky ring, a peptic stricture, and an astomotic stricture that fit into those anatomic uh, criteria. So what are the outcomes when you dilate uh, simple strictures? Well, they're very good. Um, should you be careful when you're dilating simple strictures? Well, yeah, you should be uh, careful no matter what you're doing, but uh, if you follow a couple uh, simple rules, then uh, dilating simple strictures is very safe with excellent outcomes. And should you do it? And when I say, uh, you know, should, should I do it, I, I'm talking about someone like myself who's a general surgeon, is comfortable with flexible endoscopy and using uh, intra-procedure fluoroscopy. And I think uh, absolutely. So what are complex strictures? Well, these are uh, any uh, malignancy. Uh, they're narrow or longer. And then they're associated with uh, more complicated uh, anatomy. So uh, there's a parasophageal hernia, angulation at the uh, area of the stricture. Or I would describe any uh, stricture in the small bowel or colon as immediately uh, complicated anatomy. So here are some examples of things that I would uh, consider more complicated strictures. And so should I, uh, uh, what are the outcomes? Well, this depends a lot, and there's a lot of factors that go into determining what the outcome is. I'll touch on some of these uh, individually a little bit later on. Um, should I be careful? Well, definitely. The more complex the stricture, uh, the higher the perforation rate, um, and, uh, and you need to have uh, increasing concern with whether you should do it at all. And then uh, that sort of segues into should I do this? Well, I think it depends on your... Uh, expertise, your familiarity with dilation, and your familiarity with that specific disease process. Uh, and I think you should, if you're starting to do dilation, do it in a stepwise fashion. So start with simple lesions, and then uh, grade that up to more complex ones. So now we'll talk about the patient. And the patient, I think, uh, patient factors, uh, aside from the lesion, is, is the most important thing is deciding how to uh, sedate or anesthetize the patient. So for lower risk patients, uh, younger, healthier patients, you can dilate using either moderate sedation or uh, a MAC with an anesthesia provider. A higher risk, you can see the things that would make a, a patient higher risk here. Um, I, I think it's, it's safest in those cases uh, to use MAC. When you're, you're dealing with a more complicated patient or a more complicated stricture, you really want to just have your attention on the stricture and not having uh, to deal with the, the, the um, sedation component. Uh, and then patients who are at really high risk for aspiration, uh, these patients you have to be really cautious with uh, because I think the most devastating complication of uh, dilation is actually not perforation, it's aspiration. Uh, 
um, especially if it's bilious contents. So these patients, I have a very low threshold for doing it under general anesthesia and putting an NG tube uh, proximal to the lesion prior to induction of anesthesia. Um, people ask a lot about uh, antithrombotic therapy. This is more and more common uh, problem. I think uh, therapeutic anticoagulation um, with Coumadin or uh, do, um, Doaxi is the safest thing is to hold it. Uh, the last thing you want is a patient who's therapeutically anticoagulated then bleeds after a dilation has to be actively reversed, uh, that would puts them at either higher thrombotic risk. Patients who are on dual antiplatelet therapy, if possible, you want to hold Plavix. Uh, now, sometimes that has, involves a discussion with the cardiologist about the risks and benefits of holding it, and it's, sometimes it's not possible. In general, aspirin monotherapy can be continued, uh, especially if there's a hard indication, uh, uh, such as coronary artery disease or, uh, or prior stroke. Um, if a patient is uh, relatively healthy and is just taking aspirin as a preventative measure, uh, then generally I hold it. So the next is understanding what the goal of the dilation is. Well, pretty simply, the goal of most dilation is to release obstruction and restore enteric flow. Um, but in some instances, the goal is actually to allow distal access to the lesion. Uh, so a patient who uh, needs an EUS um, or uh, has a stroke uh, and they can't swallow anyway, they just need a peg to be placed distal to the lesion. And that, what that does is guides the diameter that your dilation needs to achieve. So here's just a sort of general parameters of uh, if a patient has normal esophageal motility, uh, when, what the effect of a stricture has. So if it's uh, 13 millimeters or less, generally these patients will have uh, dysphagia to all solids, uh, but they'll be able to tolerate liquids. Uh, and at 18 millimeters, they'll be symptom free. And then somewhere in between, they'll be able to tolerate a soft food diet uh, with some modification. Uh, so that sort of can guide how you counsel the patient and how you manage them afterwards. And if you, all you're doing is dilating to pass an instrument, well, you just need to dilate wide enough to accommodate the diameter of that instrument. So based on those, you can put together a plan for what you're going to do before, during, and after the dilation. And I'll talk about some specific lesions and how to approach them. So a Schatzky's ring is very common. It's a thin mucosal membrane uh, right at the Z-line. They're almost exclusively associated with uh, hiatal hernias uh, at the leading edge of the hiatal hernia. So these can have standard uh, uh, pre-endoscopy uh, uh, um, uh, NPO status. Uh, and you can dilate under either uh, sedation or an uh, MAC. Uh, you can use, uh, uh, like Dr. Samler talked about, either a, a savory a wire-guided dilator or a through-the-scope balloon. Uh, and they respond very well to a single uh, wide diameter dilation. So 20 millimeters is the, uh, the widest uh, TTS balloon. Um, and uh, these lesions, because they're just a thin mucosal membrane, uh, respond well to that, and, and that's safe. Um, all these patients should be kept on PPI uh, afterwards uh, to reduce risk of recurrence. There was actually a randomized trial that showed in even patients who had no objective reflux on 24-hour pH study, they still had less recurrence of the Shosky ring if they were uh, placed on PPI after dilation. Uh, and these patients have almost near-complete resolution. However, there's uh, uh, a lot of late-term uh, recurrence. So they don't necessarily need a follow-up endoscopy per routine, uh, but they should be counseled that these could come back. Uh, and it's a, it's a good thing to uh, consider when you're considering whether to do a surgical hiatal hernia repair in these patients. And there's pretty uh, small bleeding perforation risk. So how about uh, peptic stricture uh, increasing in complexity? So these are smooth, concentric, uh, concentric fixed, narrowing of distal esophagus. Uh, they can be very variable in their anatomy. Uh, and if there's a very important point, if there's any concern for malignancy, any mucosal irregularities, they need to be biopsied first, and you should not dilate if there's any concern for malignancy. Uh, in these cases, uh, the more complex the stricture, the better it is to do it under MAC. So you don't have to worry about uh, uh, the sedation of the patient. Uh, and uh, I would only use a savory dilator if you're able to traverse the lesion. So you have to be able to traverse it to put in a wire. If you can't traverse it, uh, you can't use a savory dilator, and you have to use a balloon. And if you can't traverse it, the safest thing is to use a balloon uh, with a, a, a um, uh, channel and inject contrast to ensure you're in the lumen uh, uh, distal to the stricture. Uh, we talked about the rules of three. This was the traditional way to do it. Start with a dilator the size of the stricture and then increase in one millimeter or three French increments. Um, and I think you can sort of use that uh, to translate to balloon dilation. So 
you can dilate in a single balloon. You don't have to use three increments. Um, but if you want to be safe, uh, the safest way to do it is to dilate only three millimeters uh, wider than the stricture is to begin with. Uh, these patients need aggressive acid suppression after dilation. Uh, and as the stricture becomes more complex, uh, you want to do more frequent uh, reinterventions. I think the biggest mistake is to dilate a peptic stricture uh, and then not bring the patient back for a follow up endoscopy and they just restricture again. So, you want to do serial dilation starting at a week and then maybe stretching out to every two weeks and gradually increase the size of the stricture. Um, simple strictures, uh, peptic strictures, have very good outcomes. Uh, usually respond to one to three dilations, but as they become more complex, they require more and more uh, dilations to become refractory. Uh, the perforation risk, if you follow these rules, is, is fairly low, but it does, it does happen. So here's uh, sort of what we were talking about um, with re these refractory strictures. Um, so sort of broadly defined, these are uh, strictures that do not respond to a series of five dilations. You can't sustain or achieve a uh, 14 millimeter diameter. Um, so this is sort of just one algorithm for dealing with these strictures. So trying that series of five weekly dilations. Uh, if that doesn't work, uh, doing a series of uh, three uh, steroid uh, dilations with steroid injection. Um, and there is, there's mixed evidence. There's a randomized trial that showed a, that uh, steroid injection uh, did decrease the need for redilation and the success of dilation, but there's been other trials that have showed uh, no effect. Um, there's not much evidence that uh, after three dilations, um, this is, uh, you know, the steroids will ha then become effective. Um, so at that point, you need to uh, consider doing something else, either stent placement or uh, endoscopic uh, stricture incision. And then the last uh, resort is uh, obviously resection. So uh, how about eosinophilic esophagitis? This is becoming more and more, I think, uh, a recognized problem. And uh, now it's actually the most common benign cause of uh, esophageal dysphagia. Um, the, there are some endoscopic findings that you should be familiar with, uh, uh, lo um, longitudinal uh, furrows and rings. Um, circumferentially, and I think the important thing is you really have to establish a diagnosis histologically before you start doing interventions on these patients. So take multiple biopsies of the proximal and distal esophagus, uh, and then don't do a dilation. Uh, establish a diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis, and then have the patient be treated medically for that uh, by someone who specializes uh, in the treatment of these patients. Um, and then only do dilations after uh, there's been a failure of medical therapy therapy with uh, swallowed uh, steroids after a PPI trial. So these uh, uh, were initially thought to have a higher perforation rate, but I think as the disease becomes more recognized and we're treating them medically beforehand, uh, that perforation rate has uh, come down uh, with careful dilation. But these are patients I would do uh, very small increments at most uh, three millimeters uh, at a time. So going into more complex anatomy, uh, anastomotic strictures, uh, very common after esophagectomy. Um, they, when approached cautiously, have a, a low perforation rate, um, but uh, uh, that, that requires incremental serial dilations. Um, I would uh, use fluoroscopy um, to confirm the anatomy uh, distal to the stricture, because as opposed to a peptic stricture where usually it's just the stomach, um, here you have either a conduit or if a gastric bypass, a small bowel, something that you could very easily perforate with a, uh, a savory dilator or a balloon dilator. Uh, radiation strictures are something that uh, also it becomes more complex, and the more proximal the stricture, the more you want to think about protecting the airway with uh, general anesthesia. Gastric outlet obstruction uh, due to peptic ulcer disease can also respond to dilation, but uh, the perforation rate is much higher, and you also have to make sure that there's no pancreatic uh, malignancy or biliary malignancy that's causing the, the stricture. So uh, that may be with cross-sectional imagery, uh, even EUS uh, prior to attempting dilation. I always tell the medical students and residents, gastric outlet obstruction, esophageal obstruction, it's not an emergency. You can put the patient on TPN, pass a feeding tube, pass the stricture, and just wait. Uh, you want to be really careful and make sure there's not an underlying malignancy. And then moving into things that are really high risk and complex, and I, I think these are all things that um, if you encounter on diagnostic endoscopy, you have to say, well, hold on, we, let's assess what's going on, establish a diagnosis, and not do an intervention that I'm not that familiar with during that initial diagnostic uh, endoscopy. 
especially if there's any malignancy uh, suspected. That has to be uh, established uh, and staged prior to any therapeutic intervention. Um, I just put achalasia up there because, you know, you dilate achalasia, but that's a totally different animal that's uh, using an over-the-wire uh, pneumatic uh, uh, high uh, diameter uh, balloon, uh, and that's something that should only be done uh, by uh, 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 physicians, either gastroenterologists or surgeons, who are, uh, really have a disease uh, focus in achalasia. Uh, Crohn's strictures are more and more. There's evidence uh, emerging that they can be dilated successfully and uh, reduce the need for surgery. Uh, but uh, especially ileal strictures, uh, that prevent, it's a real endoscopic challenge. Um, and this is something that's, uh, become, that is much more complex and uh, should be reserved for, I think, uh, endoscopists with, uh, who have a, um, a lot of experience dilating more uh, simple strictures. Uh, and then colonic strictures, uh, when encountered on initial colonoscopy, these need to be assumed to be malignant and should not be dilated on uh, initial diagnostic uh, endoscopy. So in conclusion, I think if you consider the lesion, the patient, and the goal of the dilation, you can create a comprehensive plan uh, for how to safely and effectively uh, uh, dilate uh, these types of strictures. Um, I would start with simple lesions and bring the patient back frequently. Uh, go in small increments and do things as safely as possible. And then only with uh, experience and really a disease-specific focus should uh, uh, you undertake more complicated uh, uh, strictures uh, and uh, certainly prove uh, that strictures are not malignant before uh, dilating them initially. Thanks very much.